I had made the decision I wanted to be a professional wrestler. It was hard, really, really difficult to get to be a professional wrestler back when I wanted to break in. There weren't schools and training centers and it was a very closed business. Guys were held accountable for whoever they broke into the wrestling business. So um, it was really hard. I'd spent, you know, I was just a teenager, but I'd spent, you know, a couple years calling different offices around the country trying to convince somebody to, to train me. Couldn't find anybody. Finally, just by chance, I had contacted uh, uh, Crockett's uh, office in Charlotte and Gene happened to be working in the office that day and answered the phone. And told me they were going to have a tryout like in that in October. Well, I had just graduated from high school in that, that, uh, that year. I'm like, perfect. I'll go go down there. So, you know, got a job, and part-time job, and I, you know, washing dishes, and I sold my car and bought a Greyhound bus ticket to Charlotte, North Carolina, which that was probably far more brutal than anything that Ole and Gene ever did to me. Because <laughs> it, was, it was 24 hours of hell to get there, and then 24 hours of hell to get back. It was even worse getting back because I had gotten my ass kicked by Ole and Gene. So, um, Showed up, and uh, Oli or Gene was the only one that was there, and he passed out uh, release forms. So, you know, had the blank where your name is, and then a blank of who you were holding harmless. So I signed Gene's name. You know, I put Gene Anderson, and uh, um, Oli showed up with like six guys. That the smallest guy was like the size I am now. Okay, and uh, these were all guys they were already working with, they were all trading. So there were maybe 30, 35 guys that were down there to try out at that time. And uh, we, were, we all went to the Charlotte Coliseum because the, you know, Crockett was having a show that night. And uh, um, so we, uh, they took us out and um, made us run five miles around the old parking lot behind the Charlotte Coliseum, which was you kind of ran across, then you ran up, then you ran up a little more, then you ran back down. So it was a little circular outfit. Came back in. Came back in, you did 500 free squats. As soon as you got done with the 500 free squats, you got dropped down and you, uh, you ran the Coliseum stairs. The stairs in between the seats, you ran all the way up, all the way down, over, all the way up, all the way down, over, all the way up, all the way around. Got done with that, you did 400 push-ups. So it didn't matter how you did them, you had to do 400. Uh, even if you just picked yourself up and fell on the floor. It didn't matter how long it took, you had to do 400 push-ups. So what they were doing was blowing you up and they were trying to crack a lot of the guys that tried out. So we went from maybe 35 after the run, we're now down to maybe 28. After we did the squats, we're now down to 20. Now after we're doing the you know, stairs, we're down to you know, 17. Now we're down to 15, push-ups, you're down to 10, and then it's, you know, um, you had to put somebody on your back and run the length of the Coliseum and run back, switch, back, switch, back, and then uh, do jumping jacks until it was your turn to go in the ring. So what they were doing was they already had the other six guys in the ring with Ole, and then you got in the ring, or each prospective guy got in the ring, would have to get down in the amateur wrestling position in the, the defensive position, all fours. And then what Ole was doing was trying to teach those guys how to, I don't know what other things he was trying to teach with everybody else, but with me, how to pancake a guy out, put him on his belly, grapevine the leg and rear chin lock the guy. So if you got through guy one, then you had to get down and do it with guy two. Well, by the time you get in the ring, you're physically, you're shot. I mean, you're literally, you're shaking your arms and your legs and just from exhaustion. Exhaustion. Somehow I got through guy one, two, three, four, five, get to guy six, who's just, you know, like this, always screaming at me and uh, trying to intimidate me. And I, I don't, I just, it didn't, wasn't clicking. Maybe if, if it had, I probably would have just like, okay, I quit. But uh, the guy bellies me out, uh, grapevines my leg, rear chin locks me. I get to all four somehow, and the guys, I won't, you know, if I could have spoken, I might have given up, but Oli's like screaming at me, do you give up, you give up? 
I couldn't say anything because the guy had my jaw clamped shut. So all he takes that is, I won't give up. So he immediately tells him to break, put me down again and do it again. Okay. Does it again. Clamps it on me. Ole's in my face. I again get to all fours somehow. The guy can't grip by my leg. Get to all fours. And the guy and Ole's screaming in my face, do you give up? Do you give up? At that point, yeah, I was going to give up. But I couldn't say I was going to give up because again, my jaw was clamped completely shut. So Ole's like, that's it. Get out. I thought he meant me. I went to go to Gal. He goes, you're not leaving. Turn around. Gene slides in the ring. I get back, he, Oli tells me to get back in the all fours. Now, Oli has been the guy who's been stretching guys after all the other guys, they went through all the other guys plus all the other physical exhaustion. He gets in, stretches you, hooks you, makes you tap, sends you on your way. So, uh, one guy, he had rear chin locked and broke his jaw and knocked him out. So, I get down on all fours. <laughs> I'm serious. That's hilarious. I get down on all fours, Gene gets in the ring, and all of a sudden, he's all over me. I mean, he's pulling my hair, he's fish hooking my mouth, he's, he's digging in my eye, he's, you know, just all, I can't even imagine what he's doing, I'm, I'm confused. So all of a sudden, he goes to grab my balls. So I'm trying to get away, so I grab him by the balls, and we're rolling around, and I got a hold of his balls, and he's still trying to grab my balls. Finally gets on top of me and puts his thumb in my eye and he's like screaming, do you want to lose your eye? Do you want to lose your eye? And Oli now becomes the voice of reason and goes, hey, no, that's all right. Right? And Oli separates us. Now, in the meantime, he has smashed my face into the bottom rope, which is uh, basically aircraft cable on those WCW rings, breaks my nose and, and has, uh, I'm like cuts and scratches all over me. I find out later when I go in the hotel room, I take my shirt off. I've got bite marks on my back where he bit me. He literally, the man bit me. Bit me on the back. He's got, I got clumps of hair missing where he pulled my hair. My mouth is busted where he fish hooked me. And uh, he's screaming at me to get out of the ring. So I go to the back of the ring, go back, get cleaned up, come back out, ask what time the show was. Took the last bit of money I had for food, bought a ticket to the wrestling show, watched the wrestling show that night, which uh, featured uh, Roddy Piper and Greg Valentine in a dog collar match where, you know, Valentine split open Piper's ear. And uh, Sergeant Slaughter was on the card, Steamboat, um, a lot of Jake's, Jake Roberts, they had a big battle royal, John Stubb was there. Um, and then walked five miles back to the uh, bus station the next day, which was the most painful thing I've ever done in my life because all the lactic acid and everything else and all beat up. Got on the bus and 24 hours home, and then kept pursuing it. You were addicted at that point. I was in. I was going to do it, whether it come hell or high water. So. Did you ever hold anything against uh, Willie and Gene for that, or was that just the way things were done in that day? I did it first, yeah. But then, as I got older, I got more experience. I understood. I mean, it's all they. You have to understand that a lot of those guys at that time. They couldn't function in regular society and have a regular nine to five job. Like a lot of guys these days can, they can go out and do another job. These guys, if they were, they were either wrestlers or they were probably gonna be in jail. I mean, they were, they were very intelligent, very classy individuals, but they were the most eclectic, uh, eccentric group of people you'd ever wanna meet. And, and they just didn't fit, they were either ex, jocks, they were ex-football players, ex-athletes, or they were, you know, potential criminals. I mean, that's the truth. And you had to protect the business at all costs. So here come a bunch of wannabes. First, you got to make sure that they really want to do it. Secondly, if everybody leaves, everybody, oh, wrestling's fake. And that's a big problem for today. So that, 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 you know, everybody's, ah, that's fake. Anybody can do it. Not everybody can do it. And it takes a, a, a tremendous amount of passion to do what we do. So those guys, all those 35 guys that left there, the worst that would have happened was they'd leave and they'd go, you know, hey, wrestling might be fake or whatever. I'll tell you what, they kicked my ass. And for me to be a wrestler, uh, it's not worth it. I'll tell you that right now. It's, you have to be tough. And you, they made people at least respect it in some manner. 
Was uh, Ole Anderson the booker when you were in the Atlanta Territory? Oh, yeah. What did you Ole think and I were partners in the early 70s in Florida, about six months. Well, on and off, it was not a regular tag team, but we were teaming a lot, traveling together. And I always liked Ole. I call him. I still call him today. Yeah. A lot of people didn't like him, but him and I always got along. You know what? He's brutally honest. <laughs> He'll call you an asshole if he has to. If he thinks you are, he's going to call you that. Whatever it is, you know. And he got quite a few fights. He got beat up one time by uh, what was it, Black Jack Mulligan. Yeah. He told him off. He didn't care. He didn't care how big Black Jack was. Right. But he's like, he was that kind of guy, and he was a good booker. He was a good booker. And uh, you also had some matches with Arn Anderson, too, didn't you? Oh, there's another guy that's, yeah. yeah. There's another guy that's very good. Oof, geez, we made money, too. I worked with him and Tully. Tully Blanchard was good, you know. He was a, he was a go-getter, you know. He was not lazy. He just, you know, just, uh, which was good. I, there were some guys, they were, they were good guys, you know, but some guys you prefer to work with because there was money there. Was Jim Barnett still involved in the Atlanta Territory? Yeah, he was or? there when I was, uh, when I went there in 80, 81, 82. What did you think but he, he was not around that much. Oh, yeah. He was more around like in the 70s when I was there in 74, 75, you know. I heard he was uh, a great promoter as far as securing TV de deals and... Uh, yeah, so well, forth. he was successful, so yeah. I, I never had a whole lot of dealings with him, but uh, I liked him. He liked me. We had a good uh, relation there. He, uh, one time he came in the dressing room, my God, Ronald. <laughs> he liked the match. Yeah. You know? And uh, I had Robert Fuller in the ring. And Robert was just green starting. And Robert was all legs and arms. He was tall, skinny, you know. Just He wanted to go 150 miles an hour. And uh, so I, I got in the ring and I said, uh, and Barnett was on the stage behind, next to the curtains watching the match. And uh, <laughs> we had a sellout too. It was a packed house. And Barnett always coming to the dressing room when you had a big house. And I'm a sellout, boys, and I'm watching a butt your butt, you know. <laughs> so anyway, Robert, man, he's going to he's going to impress somebody that night. Yeah. And we went out in the ring, and I told Robert, "This headlock." He got me in a headlock. And I picked him up. He took me over, and I'm in his arm, and I went, <laughs> and he's going, <laughs> he's panicking, and I kept him on the floor for about three minutes. And Barnett's watching the match. And this kid, he turns me loose and jumps up and runs around the ring. <laughs> That's funny. I, I couldn't believe it. It's supposed to be a wrestling match. You're, I'm in a hole. He turns me loose because we're not doing anything. Barnett's watching. And uh, I did that for about 10 minutes. That's funny. <laughs> At the end, we had people standing. Coming to the dressing room, and Barnett says, What a match, boys, not all my. And he goes on and on, you know, and Robert, and the way. And, Robert's looking at me like, yeah. <laughs> it was good. We had the people standing. I mean, what else do you want? <laughs> and one of your first territories was Georgia Championship Wrestling. Just wondering if you could briefly share your memories of that and the controversial Ole Anderson that uh, not too many people seem to have gotten along. Well, with. you know what? What's funny you say Ole. I was really good friends with Ole. Ole was really good to me, and I, I can't say anything bad. In fact, when all of us were trained in with Eddie Sharkey, Eddie called up Ole Anderson and told Ole, he says, Ole, you gotta get down there and see these guys. Because at that time, I was about 320, good looking guy with hair and you know, in good shape, power lifter. And Animal was the same and Hawk and you know, Rick Rude. So Ole used to come down there and see us training. And the first guys that got into wrestling was uh, Animal, he ended up Ole got him into North Carolina. And then uh, Rick Rude came up here to Canada and I went to Hawaii. But Ole always kind of looked after us four guys. And that's after, after I was with uh, Florida Championship Wrestling, Ole took me in up in Atlanta and then he sent me to Bill Watts. So Ole had a mind for, you know, who was gonna be good, how to train guys and everything. So Ole was a great guy. And the reason why a lot of people didn't get along with him is because Ole was 
set in his ways. If he didn't like you or your look or whatever, you know, you'd be down here. So he, uh, you know, being the booker of a, a big wrestling organization like that, when you're on, you know, TBS and, I mean, he had a lot of heat with a lot of the guys. Cause he didn't just, you know, put guys on TV. It was the guys that he thought could become, you know, wrestlers. I came to Georgia Championship Wrestling and uh, I went back to Big Jim Duggan and I still didn't understand the business a lot, but I started wrestling DiBiase, Ted DiBiase, and him being a second generation wrestler, he taught me quite a bit, but it was really kind of a, a short run in Georgia. Was Ole Anderson the booker at that time? Well, when Ole came in, uh, it was Buck Roby was there when I was there, and then when Ole and the, uh, the NWA came in, I didn't get along with Ole, so that's when I left Georgia and went down to Pensacola territory. Uh, what was the issue with Ole? Well, I just we just you know didn't get along, you know, and I knew I got along with Buck, Buck Roby, and the other guys that were leaving. Uh, Robert Fuller went down and he opened up the Pensacola, Florida territory. So I just went down with him, and it was a good to sit smaller territory, but easier trips and more fun for a young guy. <laughs> At what point in time did you start using the hacksaw name? Well, that's after Pensacola. Uh, Buck Roby and Bruiser Brody, who I met in Georgia, they went to San Antonio and they called me and when I was down in Pensacola and like, hey, we got a great spot for you here in San Antonio. Uh, so that's when I made the move to uh, San Antonio and that's where I became Hacksaw. So out of 36 years, probably 33, I've been Hacksaw. I guess Ole Anderson probably would have been booking at that time. Ole Anderson and Gene, his brother, were, were, were the bookers. How did you get along with them? I've heard mixed uh, uh, reports. You know, I have no respect for Ole. Uh, I, I I can't stand him. Uh, uh, he didn't know how to treat people right. You know, he 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 was uh, kind of made racist remarks to, towards me and Mexicans, and you know, he he knew the power that he had as as a booker, and and I, I think he abused it. Uh, I never really cared for him. When you say racist remarks, um, what type of remarks, for instance? Well, um, just come out right and call you Mexican. Come here, or you know. Oh. Like. So I guess that may have I, soured your experience. Yeah. Yeah. Did you ever uh, confront him over that, or was it more he's the boss? And in those days, I guess, unfortunately, that was more acceptable talk than it is today. Yeah, no, I, I just accepted the fact that he was the boss and, you know, and I was learning, you know, I, I wasn't going to, uh, I, I wasn't going to burn the bridge where, 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 where I was working at, you know, uh, I, I was still getting the opportunity. I was still making a living and, you know, I knew that uh, I was going to get some experience there, you know, I, I just... Like I, I knew Tully Blanchard, but you know Tully Blanchard went one way and I went another way, and we were never in the same territory. Uh, so I just knew as an athlete, you know, if you work hard enough, uh, you know, you climb the ladder, and you know that's 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 my that was my intention the whole time. Didn't ask you in the last interview about Ole Anderson. Uh, what are your thoughts on him? Ole? Yes. Oh. Ole's a bad man. Ole, yep. We wrestled down there in North Carolina, Georgia, Tennessee. Yeah, back in the old days. Yeah, 50 years ago almost. And uh, we were having a discussion in the locker room one day. And Ernie Ladd was uh, uh, doing the booking. And uh, for those that don't know what a booker does, a booker puts together the matches and tells the guys uh, who they're wrestling and uh, how the finish is going to go and whatnot. And it, in other words, he, he's controlling the locker room. Well, Ole loved doing that stuff. And uh, he got pissed off, off at Ernie Ladd one day. Now, here's Ole, 5'10", and here's Ernie Ladd, 6'10". So Ole's looking up at Ernie says, You fucking... 
You you don't even know how to put matches together. What the hell's going on here? And Ernie looks at him. What are you talking about? This is a better program than you ever put together. So Ole said, you dumb fucking You think you can do this because you graduated from Grambling College? Anybody can graduate from Grambling College because it's a college. <laughs> I said, Jesus. I said, Ole, slow down here. But Ernie was laughing right along with everybody else in the locker room. Was uh, Ole Anderson the booker in Atlanta at that time? I've heard that uh, he didn't think like there was too big of a role for uh, Hulk to do at that time. Was there any? He didn't. I mean, that's the main reason why we didn't get a break. We bring us right into Atlanta. Why not bring us right into Atlanta, right there, and and and, and, and train us. And, and, and you know, there was a lot of uh, what's the word uh, when you're uh, you don't like people who aren't like you. Right. Uh, Resentment, I guess, because you guys had the physiques and he was more yeah. of a gruff. Well, we were a couple of long hair, you know, physique type guys. Oh, yeah, or so big, fat, tubby looking, you know, way. You know, old time wrestle looking guy. And we were, we were a uh, new generation, the, the, the next generation uh, of wrestlers who would begin to come along. And, and uh, yeah, there was a lot of resentment. They, <laughs> Because those guys didn't want to see us, uh, you know, taking any of their money. So they didn't help a bit. Thank you for watching the Hannibal TV. Please like this video if you enjoyed it. And click the subscribe button to not miss any of our latest shoot interviews, match videos, or news updates. Follow us on Twitter at the Hannibal TV for instant updates.